But thank you, Maya, for that really good um, intro. And I like that. I, I, I mean, I love that description, hyper real. Like it's, yeah, it's so real. It's you know, staring in the sun. That's kind of cool. <laughs> I'm going to, and also thank you to Justin and Sally for hosting me, and this has been like a, a really fun uh, reunion. I got to hang out with some of my friends and people, and friends that feel like family and all of this, so it's really cool. And I'm going to read two stories from my first collection, Black Jesus and Other Superheroes, because these were written closer to the time when I was actually in the program. So I want to go way, way back, and then we'll come closer to now and see how the language has evolved. And thank you, Maya, for reading like my best lines. <laughs> so you guys are getting the leftovers today. So both of these stories are based on true events that I'm going to read. And I'll just give you a little bit of the reality in them, but not too much, because I might get in trouble. Okay. Chew. We chew in our family. It's our God-given freedom to chew what and when we want. I chewed the legs off my grandmother's piano. It keeled over and crushed her 13-year-old bison frise, ginger snap. My granddaddy laughed his ass off. Me and my brothers used to chew shapes into things all the time. We turned straws into palm trees. I made a lily out of a milk carton for my brother's girlfriend. I had to be careful around the seams and not use too much saliva or it would have turned to oatmeal. He busted my lip for that one. My boy is just like us can't keep his teeth off things. He chewed a plastic coin into a funny shape and supposedly threw it at some girl. They suspended him for two days for a plastic coin. I had to sit in front of the superintendent with his blood red hangnails while he read off a statement from a teacher. Because of the zero tolerance policy, a suspension was warranted after the disruption caused by the object. The student chewed a coin made of plastic until it resembled a bullet and threw it yada yada while yelling bang bang, blah blah repeatedly until the situation escalated, or some garbage. I had to sit there for 39 minutes looking at that shitstorm of a desk. It was metal in the color of every dull memory I ever had, just covered in papers, papers, papers. He held his palms above the papers and patted the air as if disgusted, as if afraid to touch anything because he knew it all linked to him somehow. One wrong move would topple it and he'd be late for some god-awful appointment or something. I told him to, let's get right down to it. He sighed like he'd heard the story a few too many times from the teacher, from the principal, from that big haired news anchor and his own bosses probably. Still, he needed to hear the story right from my boy. So that's what happened. My boy told the truth of it. I told my boy to, tell, to be out with it and he stayed quiet because kids don't know what to say without a question. What happened, I asked. I chewed a shape the teacher thought was bad. She made me go to the principal. Then she brought all my stuff and called you dad to come get me. That's what he said. The superintendent dared to look at me like I coached him, like my boy is just so acutely aware of my breathing and knew every inhale and internal body gurgle and could tell the good from the bad. How was he supposed to know what gesture meant certain doom and which meant good job, son? But he said it right anyhow. I never threw it at no one. My boy told me about that crooked-eared girl who teased him all the time about his dirty cuffs. I told him never wash your cuffs for a girl. If she can't love your grease and grit, she can't love you. Well, he washed his damn cuffs and got more teasing for the trouble. That's when he chewed that shape into the coin and supposedly threw it. I knew he wasn't trying to make a bullet and pretend to kill that girl. That's crazy. I told him to tell that pudgy superintendent what he was really trying to chew into that fake money. I was trying to make a rocket. I chew rocket ships and I like guns and tanks and I was just trying to draw a rocket. But it turned to look, to look more like a small bullet than a rocket and the teacher just thought it was a bullet. The teacher just thought it was a bullet. Boys that age chew all kinds of things. I must have chewed a cock into the side of a cereal box a hundred times before I knew what it was for. Boys just celebrate themselves, you know, it's human. But the superintendent didn't get it. He just sat there on his secretary's wide wood chair thinking, your boy is an unholy wretch that will grow up to hurt people. The world is going to have to kill him someday and he'll embarrass you and drive you indoors for good. You are an enabler. You think you're helping, but you're reinforcing terrible behavior. There are volumes of books written, studies done, talk shows even about you and your boy. There will be nowhere safe to drive except hills with no life on them. The superintendent blinked. He looked at my boy and blinked. He looked at me and blinked. He looked at the stacks of pink and yellow papers folded and crinkled some thin as spit and blinked. What right did he or anybody have to judge me and mine? They call it enabling. 
I'm enabling my son to keep on with his bad behavior. They just don't understand our lives. Maybe he did chew a bullet on purpose and throw it and push her down and kick her until she cried. We all chew to survive in this world. My granddaddy chewed up until his last days on this earth. A little full applesauce lid. He made a teacup for my grandmother. I heard she told him to swallow it for being such a mean bastard all his life, but that's just how they loved each other. Everybody else can't know what it's like to put something in your mouth and have something different come out. What it means, the power. They just want to take it from us, keep us docile like starved dogs. They don't know anything about how we live, love, and die. My boy is innocent. My boy is gifted. All right, so that's one. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to do... I always have to guess. Okay, let's do this one. 69. All right, so like I said, these are all somewhat based on true stories. This one's called Ways to Mourn an Asshole. Once is not enough. Believe in Santa and Jesus and Clark and Bruce, but only till daylight. Remember not to be a child. Pretend to be ill. Wear black slacks. Pray. Cut your hair without a mirror. Buy a casket. Use the casket. Invite all of the friends. Invite no one at all. Bury the empty casket. Collect the ashes. Hold the ashes. Kick the ashes with your heel. Be glad the plastic did not break. Put the ashes away for later. Play basketball. Write an obituary. Remember not to be small. Go hunting, go mountain climbing. Remember to be very strong. Look at your muscles. Touch your abs. Remember to be proud. Take out the death certificates. Make copies of the death certificates. Draw penises on the back of the copies. Draw faces on the penises. Put the originals away for the insurance company. Open the ashes, smell the ashes, cough. Feel a little sick and shake it off. Put the ashes in glass containers. Pretend they are canopic jars. Pretend to be a pharaoh. Pretend these are the organs of ancestors. Pretend to come from greatness. Remember not to be afraid. Put one jar outside for the rain. Kill ants outside with an index finger while the rain falls. Remember to be big. Go inside. Open the plastic bag from the hospital full of clothes. Take out the wallet. Pocket $100, pocket $168. Look at the driver's license. Pull out the belt. Wear the belt. Remember to get fat enough to fit the belt. Collect the jar of wet ashes. Drop the license inside. Take the license out and wipe it off. Put the jar of ashes and, and rain in the freezer. Take it out of the freezer the next day. Sit it out on the fence. Find your hunting rifle. Fire one shot, miss. Fire again, don't miss. Remember not to care. Remember there are other jars left. All right. So I think those are the two I'll read from Black Jesus and other superheroes. So the next one is from my latest collection, How to Wrestle a Girl. And let's see. I'm gonna do two, so let's start here. Okay, good. So this one's called Smoothies. The first time a guy said I looked like a man was at the Jamba Juice stand in the mall. He was still a boy, probably my age and sticky from adolescence. You look like a man. He said it as if he had the right to say anything to me, as if it was important for his survival an echo of his ancestors who were my ancestors, long and black and muscled, though we were two strangers holding smoothies. His phone was three generations older than mine. I had superior sneakers, a designer sweatshirt, better moisturizer, and even my drink helped more protein and complexity, but he wielded <laughs> his right to possess them all in one note of disgust. I took a sip as a man in a suit too tall to have a head in my sight line jingled the change in his pocket. You look like a man. It took a few seconds before I knew it wasn't a compliment, that it was a lesson, an exchange, that he was learning, too, how to be a man by not being a girl. In Sunday school, we were learning about the first man and first woman and how Adam must have been closer to God because God made him first, and pretty much all the problems of all time thereafter came about because of Eve and a snack. <laughs> I chewed a hunk of ice that hadn't broken down properly, and a woman hit the headless suited man in the heel with her stroller. 
The boy could have said the words like he'd say hello or nice to meet you or where do you get that watch or what a wonderful day it is to be upright and breathing here together. But he said them in a different way, the way we tell strangers your shoes are untied or you have toilet paper on your ass. He saw himself in me and felt ashamed. He saw himself in me and felt proud, but pride wasn't supposed to live inside of women. So he had to walk it back and cut its throat till the blood ringed around my neck. You look like a man. Years later, it would become, you eat like a man, you walk like a man, you sound like a man. My chromosomes had not yet been tested. My birth certificate says female, live birth, seven pounds and three ounces. I didn't think I wanted to be loved by boys until that boy told me it was not possible. I don't remember what I looked like then, a few years ago, but I remember him, his dirty chucks, ashy corners of his mouth and dry scalp. Back then I stared deeply at people the way children do, still curious. He existed. I didn't expect him to look back though. Children are rarely seen, but I wasn't a child anymore and had not fully realized that. Now strangers could assert their judgments on my whole body, my whole story without permission. You look like a man. I was three sips into the smoothie before it hit. To be a woman seemed a terrible thing to have happen, and it happened at 3.54 on a Friday when I was 14 to the sound of a blender jolted to life. Women have to be small, give birth, wear makeup. I could see all the women, the court reporters, the accountants, psychics and secretaries, biologists and senators, important but nameless, with inconvenient hairstyles and morning routines. Men got to invent women over and over, one generation after another, by the grace of God. The woman's stroller spit out a toy from what must have been a child tucked inside. The mother cooed, then retrieved the toy and fed it back to the stroller. The mall was not a place to fall apart. It happened anyway. When I get hurt, usually the universe opens up a little, like a bullet through a watermelon. Things separate and scatter. It feels like this is how we really are all the time and everything else is just pretend. We pretend to have legs and skin and penises and milk ducts. We pretend some skin looks one way while other skin is different. We pretend to have green eyes and brown eyes and yellow teeth and gray teeth and the sky is blue to us in the day and black at night. We pretend lots of things that are only sort of true when we are the sky and time and memory and the center of the earth and destiny and gods and gravity and salted oceans and children of the gods who ate their mothers and birthed the constellations and nebulas and death are a myth because everything goes into itself to begin again. There was fear and doubt on the boy's face when I finally turned away. The condemnation dissolved. I, a girl, would grow to be a better man than he and still be a woman. The sugar pooled like acid on my tongue when the feeling passed. All the other customers departed and it was just us under the fluorescent lights together again. There seemed nothing left to prove and a whole new point was born between us that we had not yet named. All right. Let's see, Let's see how many was that? Three? Did I do three already? Okay, good. I'm gonna take a break in a second. Okay, we got, here's the last one. All right. So this one is called Black Communion. And I recently learned a lot about Catholicism from a recent trip, and it's just wild, oh my God. <laughs> but this has a brief little, brief little understanding of what I used to know. Black communion. It was communion day when Pastor Short announced before the congregation his engagement to a woman who was not our mother. I learned people just feed the possessions of the dead to goodwill so they don't sprout bad dreams that pretend to be memories. Instead of doing our little by little Sunday donations of daddy's clothes, we went to church. Communion was my favorite religious activity. We got to eat our God and drink his blood once a month. Christians are something else. But I can't deny that it is a little bit empowering to think we can consume our creator and he'd be totally cool with it. The ritual of getting dressed exhausted me. The dresses and the pumps and the matching sling purses, I hated it. T loved it. She loved the show a pageant of sinners and powdery, all powdery and polished, ready to be doused with Jesus' bucket of forgiveness, even though she never stayed awake for half of it. When we left for church, Mama's makeup looked like something to peel off, far too light, leaving the trunk of her neck dark. We never said anything. At least, at least she was getting out of the house. Sister Bloom read the announcements. Couples, ministry, mating times, vacation, Bible study schedule, building fun goals, etc. Out of all that BS, she left off a lot of the good stuff. Still, I was waiting for the main event. 
Catholics have a different process from what I saw on TV. They have communion every week and line up while a priest hand delivers a wafer directly into their mouths one at a time, and it doesn't even stop there. Then they drink from the same cup of juice. There was no way I would get all dressed up for Pastor Short to slide an oyster cracker with his bare walrus fingers onto my tongue. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Sister Bloom forgot to mention that Pastor Short had been fornicating with our mother for half a year since Daddy died. Second, she forgot to mention the dick pic Pastor Short sent to my sister T. Then Sister Bloom forgot to mention that once T got that dick pic, he'd given up a lot of power and could never get it back, so he stopped coming over more and more until his absence forced Mama to actually go to church again and confront him. Lastly, Sister Bloom failed to mention that Pastor Short was a greasy-lipped hypocrite, so I was like, whatever, lady, you work on your building fund. <laughs> T ate and drank her sacrament before the big moment because she always forgot or never cared and was ready to fall asleep and fell, fall into her creepy sleep again, sitting straight up with her eyes half open like a basset hound in a floral dress. I saved my communion until after everyone else tossed back their cups. Jesus tastes like low sodium saltines and Welch's grape juice and was probably into carbs. Mama's makeup had blended well over the hours, turning her face into a daub of peanut butter. I considered telling her that Pastor Short's new fiance was ugly, which was true, but I hadn't developed a habit of talking to my mother. We weren't that kind of family. She'd been gripping the pews tightly for a while as if trying to balance herself, screaming beautifully in silence. I really thought I should say something. After the Jews came the hymn, I know it was the blood, the most jubilant chant about bathing in the vital fluids of a deity ever written. It had the cadence and delight of nursery rhymes, though the irony was not lost on people. A song and dance of the conquerors and the conquered. A kind of covenant beyond the moment to something deep into the future with a fist around the past. Once the music was in full ecstasy, Mama made a sound. She said, huh, with her whole chest. A note between scorn and epiphany. Then I said it too, except I was all scorn and no epiphany. Maybe it was the sugar and the liquid dye and pureed fruit, or the grit of salt and sugar on our tongues that evoked sudden calm. calm. The church was disproportionately women, most of the men tending to the altar, circling the pastor while the audience of women with hands stretched out propped up the men in their elevation to heaven. I only imitated her revelation at the time, but my mother had figured it out, that at any moment we women could remove our hands from the air, take back our obedience, our bodies, swallow our devotion and the whole establishment would cave in like hollow bread. She understood how the price we pay to worship is grave and will tax us to the marrow, how the dead stay dead, and it is the living who will frighten, astonish, and disappoint. I always saved my sacrament because I wanted to eat the last of our God my own way. All right, to me. Thanks.